Welcome to Alternative Investing. I'm Paul Waldy filling in for Andrew Bell today. And here with me is our regular Friday co-host, David Kaufman, president of West Court Capital. Hi, David. How are you? Great to be here. I'm great. Thank you. All right. Well, on this program, of course, we explore investment concepts outside of the traditional realm of stocks and bonds. It's for investors like you who may be looking to expand your portfolios with some alternative places to put your money places not in the public markets, but in funds or products that fly a little more under the radar. And on BNN, we hear a lot of investing advice on how to play the ever-growing world of exchange-traded funds or ETFs. So on today's program, we are making the connection between ETFs and your alternative investments. And there is always a strategy to explore there. So, David, let's start with a 101 just on ETFs in general. Exchange-traded funds, what are they? How do they work? The basics. Of course. We hear about ETFs every day. And, and, and exchange-traded funds are securities that, that track something. So they track an index or they track a commodity or a basket of assets. So we might have one that, that tracks a uh, uh, financial sector in a given country, for example, and they put that together. Uh, and they trade A publicly and B throughout the day. So mm -hmm. unlike mutual funds, which have interday liquidity, so you put an order in at 10 a.m. to sell your mutual fund, you'll get filled at the end of the day at whatever the prevailing price is then. But with ETFs, when you choose to sell, you're selling right then, like other publicly traded securities. Uh, and the, the main advantages uh, to, to ETFs o over, say, individual security selection mm -hmm. is that the, full, the first is that they provide full liquidity because uh, even broadly traded individual securities don't have the same kind of liquidity as some of these enormous ETFs that we hear about, about regularly. In addition to that, we have diversification. So it, even if someone had a, a huge sum of money, they would still have difficulty deploying it uh, in a fully diversified manner right. and still have a real position in, in, in each uh, security that they're interested in. So you get that kind of instant diversification through an ETF. The next is a very important issue, which is a very low MER, expense mm -hmm. ratio. We know that in Canada we have the highest mutual fund fees in the developed world, sometimes uh, north of 2.5%, 3%. When you get into the ETF world, you're down, literally down into the 25 beat to 75 beat. Because there's no manager, basically. There's yeah. no manager. And what that, it's, it's passive management. By the way, by beeps, I'm, I'm referring to 0.25% as compared to, say, 2.5%. So there is a manager, and their, their role is to, is to go out and make sure that you're replicating whatever it is that they advertise to replicate, like an index. Uh, in addition to that, they can go long or short. Now, uh, in, when you're buying an ETF, you're always going long. It's just a question of whether that ETF is long or short. So, for example, you can be long um, the S&P 500 with an ETF, or you can be short the S&P 500 with another ETF because it's an inverse ETF. Mm. So the idea would be that you'd get exactly the opposite of the returns that the mm. S&P... And, and that's an advantage over mutual funds, some of which can't go short. Yeah, right? mutual funds so, have very strict regulations about yeah. how, short, how short they can go. But again, that's an actively, an actively managed concept, where here you get to be the manager. The purchaser of the ETF says, I want to go short whatever it is, whether it's gold or the S&P 500, and you just buy the inverse fund. Right. Now, the next step with that, of course, is the use of leverage. So uh, traditionally, if you want to use leverage in your investing as, as an individual, you have to use a margin account, and that, many people do that, of course. But what ETFs allow you to do that if you want to make a levered bet, you can go and buy a two times or a three times ETF that will give you twice or three times the volatility of that day's experience in the markets. Mm. And I think that Vikash, our, our guest today, will talk about some of the downsides of levered investing okay. using ETFs. But because uh, essentially they replicate that day's trading and not over a, an extended time period. And that's how we get into using ETFs for alternative investments. It's leveraging and that kind of thing that we're going to get into. Exactly. One, one of the things that separates alternative investing from others, if you think about hedge funds, for example, is their ability to go long and short, their ability yeah. to use leverage. And those are two things that you can accomplish very effectively and cheaply using ETFs. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break, but we're going to continue our discussion on ETFs and alternative investing with Vikash Jain. He's a portfolio manager with Archer ETF. We're going to find out how ETFs play into his alternative strategy. That's coming up on Alternative Investing. Stay with us. Welcome back to Alternative Investing. I am Paul Waldy, and here with me is David Kaufman, president of West Court Capital. Today, we're talking about how you can use ETFs in your alternative investments. And we've got a great guest today who can tell us why he thinks now it's the time for investors to capitalize on alternative investments around the world. He says anyone can do it with ETFs. 
Vikash Jain is a portfolio manager at Archer ETF. Hi, Vikash. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm well. Thank you. Thanks. Tell us a little bit about Archer ETFs and this sort of global nature that you guys look at. Yeah. Uh, Archer ETF, we are a global tactical portfolio manager. And what I mean by that is global, we go across the world, any country, any sector, any asset class, commodities, equities, bonds. Uh, and by tactical, what I mean is that part of our mandate is also to protect client's capital. And in the world that we're living in, that means sometimes having to move, take advantage of opportunities where they exist, but also to be able to move to cash if that's what's required. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what, what global and tactical means. Most of our clients are high net worth families and foundations, and they see us as an alternative to the traditional buy and hold stock and bond portfolio, usually North America. Mm -hmm. So we're an alternative to that. Is there, is there a compelling story uh, to, to, to bring us to why it is that we should be considering global ETFs now? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. We, we see, we, our view is, is that the world is, uh, we are in the middle of a global transformation right now. We're going from a world where we have one superpower to a world where power will be dispersed more widely. And I mean economic power, political power, military power. Uh, this is a process that didn't start today or last week. It started 30 years ago when China really began its reforms after the death of Chairman Mao. India joined them 10 years later. We are in the middle of it right now. It will continue for another 20 years. Uh, last year, uh, China surpassed Japan to become the world's second largest economy. Mm. This year, China will become the world's largest manufacturing economy, even bigger than the U.S. Wow. And what Canadian investors need to realize is that this process is going to go on and that the opportunities, therefore, are beyond just North America and uh, the G7 industrialized countries. Uh, to benefit, you need to be invested across these markets, in, into these other newly emerging markets, with the knowledge also that there is more volatility. So mm -hmm. you need to be more nimble, be making more tactical decisions on when you go in, when you get out, sometimes going back into cash if that's what's required. All right, so let's get down to the basics here. So you've talked about tactical uh, strategies with ETFs. There's strategic strategies with ETFs. Take us through the difference. Uh, what do you mean by tactical and how quick can you move? Well, that's the beauty of ETFs. Uh, and the ETF has really developed in the last uh, five years. I mean, the, uh, ETFs have been, have been around for about 25 years. But in the last five years, we've seen a real development in terms of the types of ETFs that are available, the markets that are, are available and the, the best ETFs, the largest ETFs that are available, also have incredible liquidity. There's no problem investing uh, in those or getting out when you need to. Mm. Um, and you have access to all of these markets very easily at a very low cost, cost that you could not have imagined five or ten years ago. Um, so when it comes to making a tactical decision, you may decide that a particular country is a good investment. One example right now uh, is India. It's just gone through an, uh, a fairly significant correction in its markets from last November to now. It's down about 20%. Uh, it's a good time to buy what is otherwise a good, solid economic story. And an ETF on India will allow you to do that. If you wanted to do that directly with stocks, it's just yeah. not possible, right, other than through an ADR market. Right. So if you want to do it directly, walk me through how I use ETFs as, as my tools in my toolkit to achieve both strategic and tactical. So be specific. Give me an example of a trade. Um, a strategic decision. If you accept the thesis that uh, we're in this transformation period and that we need to be investing more broadly, your uh, Canadian investor holding, let's say, a, a portfolio of North American stocks and, and uh, bonds right. may want to include emerging markets. Uh, the simplest way to do that is to take a broad emerging market exposure, something like uh, the Vanguard Emerging Market ETF, VWO. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go on to the TSX, or the, sorry, the, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, and buy, um, buy VWO. It's as simple as that. That gives you exposure to over 800 companies mm -hmm. from around the world that are dealing in these markets. So that's strategic. That's your strategic decision. Okay, then you hit tactical. Then, then tactical, well, the, this example of, uh, of India that I just gave, yeah. or uh, right now energy is very powerful. So you may want to be investing in the energy sector. You can do that uh, with an ETF like uh, XEG in Canada, which is the iShares 
uh, energy ETF, uh, or XLE, which is the similar one in, uh, in the U.S. Those give you exposure immediately. With one trade, you have exposure to a broad range of energy producers in Canada or the U.S. Uh, so what you've done there is you've raised your exposure to that sector without significantly taking on company-specific risk. We've seen uh, for years, you know, on the front page of the business section every day, it tells us how much gold costs. But that mm -hmm. does, it, historically, that didn't mean that an average investor could walk out and just go and buy gold. Uh, it's more difficult than that, plus there's storage issues and all of that. Uh, so now we have things such as the Spider Gold GLD in, in New York, which is a $56 billion market cap, and we understand that Soros and Paulson own, own a lot of it. So even mm -hmm. the big, big investors are using ETFs mm -hmm. to access that. And then you get other things that are somewhat esoteric uh, uh, to, to a lot of viewers, currencies and futures trading, managed futures, trend following. And from what I understand, there's ETFs that are every day that are being introduced mm -hmm. that are getting very specific. Yeah. And is, is that a good trend? Uh... <laughs> is it a good trend? Um, it's getting close. As you get more and more specific, obviously, you're getting closer and closer to simply picking individual company, or companies. Mm -hmm. And if that is what you want to be doing, then yes, it is a good trend. Our view is, though, that uh, the, the bulk of returns for any given portfolio are going to come from the asset level decision. By that, what I mean is you know, your decision to be in stocks or bonds, your decision to be in in the U.S. versus uh, China, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. That decision is going to affect your returns much more than picking company A or company B. And so for our purposes, that, is, that trend is not very meaningful for us. Mm -hmm. right? We are sticking to the higher level decisions. That's where we're putting our energies and efforts. Mm -hmm. Our analysis is on the macroeconomic level to say it's a good time to be in okay. market A or market B. All right, Vikas, let's get down to brass tax. You give us three ETFs you like. Uh, number one, XLE, which is the uh, iShares uh, U.S. Energy ETF. It holds about 40 companies, uh, lots of oil majors like Exxon, Chevron, uh, mm -hmm. Conoco, as well as some oil services like Halliburton. And if you are uh, bullish on energy prices, uh, then on that crude oil and oil prices generally are going up, this is a very good way to, to hold it. The other thing these companies do, because it's, they're U.S. majors, they invest, they have operations around the world. So you're going to benefit from global energy demand, not just North America mm -hmm. uh, uh, specific demand. So, so that's why I like XLE. XLE that's why. A couple others? Uh, another one that I've mentioned is VWO. Yeah. And so, uh, as I said, this, uh, this is the Vanguard Emerging Market ETF. It gives you exposure to over 800 emerging market firms. The nice thing about it is it's uh, diversified across countries. It's not overly focused on any one country. Um, it's diversified across sectors. So you have, you have the uh, commodities uh, sectors in there, but you also have sectors that are more domestically focused, like uh, financials or retail. Mm -hmm. And, and that, a lot of growth in the emerging markets is going to be in, in the domestic sectors. Mm -hmm. So that's why VWO is good. The other thing about it is it's incredibly cheap, mm. 27 basis points, 0.27%. Wow. Mm. Versus what? what versus what are some of the other ones? Well, its nearest competitor is the iShares MSCI Emerging Market ETF, uh, EEM. Uh, that one is 72 basis points. Oh, wow. So it's the yeah. magnitude difference. Yeah, and do you have a third, a third pick, a third favorite? Uh, another one uh, would be the one I mentioned earlier as well, EPI, which is the Wisdom Tree India ETF. It gives you exposure to about uh, 80 of the largest Indian companies. Uh, and again, the same idea. It's getting the ones that are exporting, but it's also getting a lot of ones that are focused on the domestic market. And India is uh, a great economic story. It's, having, it's faced some headwinds. It's had a serious correction in the last few weeks because of inflation issues, uh, reserve bank issues. But longer term, it's a great story. Mm. Interestingly, at the top of the show, we talked about the advantages of ETFs is being able to access the strategy that you want to access uh, with full liquidity and uh, with, with great precision. I know that you have uh, uh, three ETFs that you don't like, not so much necessarily because of what they're trading in, but whether or not they're actually achieving yeah. the direction that, that they purport to achieve uh, in their documents. Can you talk to us about three examples of that? Yeah. Uh, well, crude oil. You know, you look at crude oil and everybody sees the price is going up, up, up. Uh, so you want to be in the crude oil ETF, USO. Unfortunately, USO, as well as other crude oil and other commodity ETFs, use futures to gain their exposure. And the result of that is, is that they suffer from 
just the structure of the futures market, something called contango. Every time they roll the futures contract, it bite, takes a bite out of their returns. As a result, if we look at the return of, uh, on the price of WTI, West Te Texas Intermediate, from December 2009 till today, uh, that, the price of that is up about 5 or 6 percent. The ETF, USO, is actually down almost 10 percent. So you can see how much of a bite uh, mm. Contango on the futures is taking from that. That's one. Uh, the other one is uh, HUX. Not because I dislike that one specifically, but in general, levered ETFs. Again, they use futures or some other derivative to gain exposure to their underlying index. Which is what? What is their underlying index? Uh, this one is a TSX 60. Okay. It, uh, but you know, whatever it may right. be, uh, they gain, to gain exposure, they use futures. And uh, obviously, it's not one-for-one one futures. It's sometimes two-for-one yeah. or three-for-one. And then what you'll find is the more volatile that market is, the further off target your return will be, uh, the longer you hold the thing. So, so you, can, you can get a surprise at, at the end of, uh, of a week or a month where, where you made the right bet you thought, but your returns are not exactly what you expected? The longer you hold it, the bigger your surprise. Okay. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. If you hold it for one day, no problem. So you much for get. buy and hold. Yeah, right? <laughs> so those, those, uh, the levered strategies uh, are not something we employ, but certainly for investors who are looking for uh, uh, very short term, in other words, under a week holding, they are ready to make those calls, by all means, those are there, and they're, and they're good for that. All right. Well, for cash, we've got to leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, David. It's for cash, Jane, Portfolio Manager at Archer ETF. And coming up, we're going to answer some viewer emails. And don't forget, you can always send your question about alternative investments to us at alternativeinvesting at bnn.ca. Welcome back to Alternative Investing. I'm Paul Waldy, joined by David Kaufman, president of Westcourt Capital. And David, it is now time to answer email questions. And we had a few great questions on last week's show dealing with private equity. Let's get the first one. Uh, this is an email from Samuel in Toronto. I enjoyed Brent Belsberg's appearance on last week's show. What does a private equity fund like his do when they find a great purchase that's too large for them to invest in? That's a great question, Samuel. First of all, let, let's put some parameters on this. A private equity fund, let's just say it has uh, $100 million. Uh, usually the offering documents will limit the, any, the, the, the total percentage of the total assets under management that can be deployed into one specific purchase. Right, which because makes they sense. Have, yeah, yeah, they have to be diversified. <laughs> yeah. So let's say that it's 25%. Uh, so they're going to invest $25 million four times at, at, the, at the max. But a $50 million investment comes along that's very attractive. They don't want to pass it up because they do a lot of digging to find these in the first place. So what they'll typically do is they'll syndicate that investment. And what that simply means is that they'll split it up between them and either individual institutional investor, another private equity fund in some cases. It's called a club deal. Uh, and what they'll usually do is give first dibs, as it were, to the existing investors in their fund to mm. go on a sidecar and invest alongside them with extra funds. The benefit that, that accrues there to those investors is, is that the money that they invest outside the fund is fee-free. So they get kind of a free ride uh, along the money that's inside the fund on which uh, they are paying fees. That's a great question. Is it pretty common, though, or is it? It's very, kinds, yeah. it's very common because you don't want to walk away from a deal just because it's a little bit larger right. than, than what you're allowed to do. Okay. All right. Now we've got another email here. This is from Barb in Vancouver. Why do we see large pension funds placing so much of their private equity money in foreign countries, airports in Europe, toll highways in Australia, wind farms in California? Aren't there suitable investments that would allow these funds to keep their money home in Canada? Great question. Uh, first of all, the, we have to remember that Canada is, of course, a relatively small economy with very, very large pension funds uh, that, 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 that are major players globally because of their size and their expertise. And their number one objective, of course, they would love to invest in Canada, I'm sure, but their number one objective is to have returns for their, for their uh, stakeholders, you know, the pensioners yeah. across this country. So they have to follow the deals. So let's say that they think that infrastructure is a great play because we hear about infrastructure investing yeah. all the time now, and they find, for example, an airport in New Zealand that uh, is uh, open for private investment. They will not turn that down because it's not in Canada. Uh, in fact, they have to look all around the world because they have to deploy billions and billions mm -hmm. of dollars. So in Canada, you do see infrastructure investments, for example, here in Toronto on the Highway 407. Yeah, which Confederation is, Bridge and, uh, and PEI and Bruce right. Power Plant and you, Tunnel and Windsor. Everything, and in fact, some people yeah. say that, that as, as governments uh, feel more of the pinch, they might start to privatize more of their infrastructure. And you may see 
Canadian as well as, as foreign pension funds yeah. and institutional investors make private placements in Canada because yeah. uh, it's certainly a, a very uh, considered it globally to be a very safe place to, uh, to invest for a lot of different reasons. And, and pension funds like a lot of these investments, don't they? Because it gets them out of the equity markets and all the volatility surrounding them. These things can be steady cash generators a little bit more longer term, right? That, yeah, things. I mean, they do have a mark-to-market problem where they, where they have right. to you know, periodically demonstrate what it's worth. But the bottom line is that they, they, they require cash flow on a very, very long-term basis. And they know that they have a fixed number of dollars that's going to come in every year that they have to deploy. So that there's actually uh, a lot of art that goes along with the science there to make sure that they can deploy that in a, in a responsible fashion yeah. to meet both their short, medium, and long-term objectives. All right, well, David, let's talk about what's coming up next week on the program. Next week's going to be great. Where The topic for next week is Canadian farmland mm. investing. Sounds kind of kind of boring, but no, it, it's, it's not. This is not. <laughs> this is not buying farmland to convert into condos. This no, no. is buying farmland because keeping farm, a farmer there and producing. Keeping it, yeah. a farmer mm-hmm. there, and our guest will be uh, Stephen Johnson from Ag Capita. Uh, there are a few funds now operating in Canada that operate. They're they're basically uh, using two theses. They have a macro thesis, which is that that farmland across the world will go mm-hmm. up in value because the products that the farms produce will go up in value. Uh, and they, they, their, their main premise is food, feed, and fuel, mm-hmm. which is that as you get an emerging middle class across the world, they eat more meat. Uh, it takes a lot more grain to feed the animals to, to, in order to create the meat. Uh, uh, the uh, people will just eat more because there's more people out there. There's, there's more people all the time. and There's fewer arable acres all the time. Uh, and you also have biofuels. In a micro sense, Saskatchewan is considered, in particular, Western Canada in general, considered a bit of an arbitrage play because they, even when you adjust, when you normalize on a price, on a, on, on a uh, unit production basis, that it's still very, very cheap to buy Canadian farmland versus farmland yeah, in other Lots of regulations, though, in Saskatchewan in particular, and, and Stephen's going to have to talk about that because Saskatchewan's it, a, a tough place to buy farmland. <laughs> That's right. A lot tougher than Ontario or a lot of parts around the world. It is. Historically, it has been. Uh, that's, been that, that's loosening up a little bit now. Uh, and I think that what you'll see is that it may not be such an opportunity internationally to invest in Canadian farmland, but for Canadians, Canadians can do it easier. They don't have to worry about the Ukraine and Russia and Brazil, that's places right. that have very significant political risk when they can look in their own backyard. And to Barb's issue from the other question, yeah, exactly. keep the money right here in Canada. <laughs> oh, it's going to be an interesting program. All right. Well, David, thanks very much. Terrific. Thank you. It's David Kaufman, And that is all we have for today's program and of course we will be back next friday at 11 30 eastern 8 30 pacific with another edition of alternative investing and don't forget if you got a question about alternative investments or if there's something you'd like to see us cover on the program you can email us at any time at alternative investing at bnn.ca and don't forget to check out our website bnn.ca for past guests and upcoming guests thanks for watching i'm paul waldy we'll see you again next week